information for the vehicle. Hey everybody, how's it going? So I am here with Aaron Lowe. He is from AutoCare. AutoCare had a lot to do with uh, getting the right to repair bill passed, and he's also a really hardcore advocate for right to repair when it comes to automotive. So I wanted to have him on just to answer some questions and raise awareness of this issue, since more and more car manufacturers have been trying to push back against the right to repair in the automotive space. And a lot of people I don't think are really aware of the, where the future is headed if this trend continues. So, Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Thanks for having me. Okay. So, the, the first question that I would have is, can you just kind of explain what the 2012 and 2020 automotive right to repair bills, what problems were they seeking to solve, and uh, how is automotive repair different now than it would have been if these two did not pass? Sure. Well, the, what was going on was that information tools, software that the independent repair shops needed to repair, maintain late model vehicles, computer controlled vehicles, was becoming more difficult, expensive, and, and sometimes impossible to get. So we um, started working on right to repair back in, really it was 2001, and the manufacturers strongly opposed it. And it wasn't until we moved to the state of Massachusetts, where a very consumer oriented, very um, you know, pro-consumer state, um, we, we started getting making headway. And we had a ballot question on the 2012 ballot in Massachusetts that said that any information tool software that the manufacturers make available to their franchise dealers, they needed to make available to the independent aftermarket. And then it actually said that the car companies had to maintain, uh, starting in year 2018, a cloud with all of their uh, diagnostic and repair software that you could download onto a laptop and be able to um, maintain or be able to diagnose and repair a vehicle using a standardized interface. So that, that really changed the dynamics because now um, independents had access to the same information, the proprietary tools, the software that the dealer had to repair the car, and they could compete on a much more level playing field with, with the dealer. Um, so a huge um, change in the dynamics, and, and suddenly now independents didn't have to turn cars away and send them back to the dealerships or, or even bring the cars to the dealerships themselves to get them that some of the repairs completed. So it was a big plus for the um, aftermarket uh, and for consumers too. The problem is that technology is advancing and, um, you know, is changing rapidly as we all know. And what we're seeing now is that, um, you know, a lot more of the data is being transmitted wirelessly from the car to the manufacturer. Also, we're seeing the car companies starting to put uh, firewalls around their vehicle systems and then forcing the independents to, or anybody repairing a car to go through um, an authorization system through the manufacturer. So in each manufacturer is going through their own proprietary authorization system. So this is creating still yet another um, barrier to repairs. And so what we did is we, we pushed legislation in the state that would say, if you own a car, you should be able to have that data, the repair data on your car, just the repair data. Um, you should have access to it and you should have the ability to forward that data to the repair shop of your choice. And you need to do this in a secure manner, um, but you should be able to have control and access to the data your car is producing. And then it said, if you needed to put a firewall around the vehicle, you need to do it in a standardized way so that every manufacturer is not requiring a different system for access to their vehicle diagnostic systems. And the car company shouldn't be controlling it. It should be controlled independently of the manufacturer. So that was on the ballot in 20, um, 2020, and it passed 75 to 25%. Car owners were strongly in favor of um, having control of their data and having access to a competitive repair market, which they said back in 2012 as well. Um, so. The customers, you know, the car manufacturers, customers have spoken. They want control of their data. They want they want to have available competition in the, you know, in the repair industry. So guess what? The manufacturers, instead of listening to their customers, have decided the best way to fight this is to go to court. So they filed a legal action, um, I believe, just around Thanksgiving of this year. And that court case is now heading toward hopefully a resolution in the next several weeks. Uh, we're not really certain when the date will be resolved, but the trial was held on June 14th and it, there continues to be discussions. But 
we're hopeful that it'll be the trial will be resolved sometime by the end of July. Okay, so just try to break that down a little bit. I have a lot of a lot of, a lot of questions yeah. for you. So the first thing is, a lot of people are at. So uh, I'm sure you're aware of the commercials that were presented against rights to repair for oh, automotive yeah. last year. My my personal favorite is there's a commercial with scary music and a woman talking like this, and she's walking through a parking lot, and she's walking to her car, and somebody's following behind her, and then like a, and then they and the implication in this video, and they talk they're talking about sexual assault statistics and they're implying that you are going to be raped or sexually assaulted in a parking lot if this passes because a stalker is going to get access to everything inside your car be able to stalk you to the parking lot and then either rape and kill you now one of my coworkers as a mechanic was saying that if your car has onstar on it if you have an abusive husband and he has onstar he could uh, not only could he track your car he could remotely disable your car if he wanted to but uh, one of the main questions that was coming up from a lot of people is, A, why is my car storing this information on me? Uh, B, like, wh so pretty much, what, what is my car storing and why does it need to store this information? And also, what specifically, what type of information, wh why do repair shops need access to any of that information inside the car to fix it? Well, those are great questions. And, and, and you know, um, thankfully, the um, citizens of Massachusetts saw through those ads and realized they were scare tactics. And, um, you know, the, the bill is very limited in wording to mechanical information. So obviously we're not talking about access to personal data and location information, which you don't need to repair a car. But why the manufacturers, I mean, they, they have access to a huge amount of data from a vehicle. I mean, there is there are sensors in virtually every aspect of a car, whether it's even in your seat, because they have sensors for airbags. So because you don't want your airbag inflating too much if you're at a certain weight. So it inflates based on the, on the weight of the passenger, which is a really good safety function. But it also allows the manufacturer to track a lot of data on in individuals. And they probably, you know, accept different data, need want different, different data for different reasons. But the key to us is most car owners aren't even aware that their data is being taken um, from the vehicle and, and being stored. And in some cases, that data is being used by other parties, um, third parties. So, um, you know, there's just very little information the consumer has on all these things. And so what we were trying to do through the bill is, number one, make sure the consumer knows that their data is being accessed. And two, make sure that they can control at least their mechanical data so that they can still have choices. Where we're headed in the future is that the onboard diagnostic device may you know one day be history first of all um you know they because they can get all this data wirelessly they don't need the obd port anymore to gain that data now it's required by federal law but it's only required for emissions related data not anything else so if the manufacturers were to restrict access to the brakes to everything else from that obd system they could legally do that and therefore the only way we'd have access to it is to go through the manufacturer Number two, electric vehicles, which everybody's talking about now, and, and you know whether you believe it's going to be tomorrow or sometime in the future, electric vehicles are going to be a bigger part of the future. They don't have OBD systems. They don't have that same access to the OBD data. In fact, Tesla makes very little, if anything, available to independents to repair their vehicles. So we're you know without access to this data through the telematic system, we're going to be out, you know the independent will be left on the outside and be dependent on the manufacturer who is also one of their biggest competitors to obtain data. So all we're trying to do, we're not trying to gain any, any preference. We just want a level playing field so that we can continue to compete for consumers and consumers can continue to have choices and, and, and simply control over the repair experience. Okay, so the, from what I understand, they, you still technically have to have an OBD port. However, it's only required to uh, that, the, that that port give you access to emissions right. data, whereas the rest of the diagnostic information for the vehicle, that is something that they are that uh, they could move to wireless. And without this bill, they could just say, okay, we're going to move all vehicle diagnostics to wireless. You don't have access to wireless because the old build excludes wireless and you're screwed. Now... Uh, one of the things that I don't think a lot of people understand, many people understand that Tesla is a fairly anti-rights repair company when it comes to repairing their cars. But one thing that really shocks most people that I speak to is when I point out, by the way, Toyota, Ford, Honda, Nissan, and, uh, and General Motors, which makes Chevy, GNC, and all the others, uh, all donated millions of dollars to this fear campaign, trying to get people to believe that if 
this legislation is passed that you will have your home broken into and be raped in a parking lot. What car brands, if any, exist are pro right to repair, and would you say fully support everything that you advocate for, if any? Yeah, I does mean, that exist? I, I, it's hard for me to. Almost all the manufacturers are opposing uh, the right to repair. The twenty twenty uh, ballot question. As far as I know, every one of them opposed it. I'm not aware of any that supported it. There, there are some manufacturers um, that do a better job than others of, of working with the independent aftermarket to make sure they have tools and information. But it's um, when it comes to access to wireless data and and you know continuing to make sure there's a level playing field in that area. As far as we know, none of them were supporting it. Um, it was it was complete opposition. Now they spent over and they spent twenty five million plus to oppose it. I mean, yeah, we we had to spend a lot of money to try to fight it for it, but they, you know, it was, it was difficult to keep, to keep pace with the money they were spending um, to oppose this ballot question. Um, unfortunately, fortunately for us, they, I think, um, underestimated the intelligence level of, of consumers in how they addressed it, but, you know, it was still a tough battle, an intense battle. And, and you know, I think consumers spoke and, you know, they want choice. And I think it, it's imperative that, the manufacturers listen to what their customers are telling them. And that is they like to be able to get their cars repaired where they want and they want to be have control of their data. So we're, we're, this has been a long-term battle and we're, we're in it for the long term, but it's been, it's been a tough battle against some very well-funded adversaries. Okay. So just to be clear. So if someone wants to give their money to a company that is pro right to repair in the automotive space, when it comes to get, making sure that diagnostics are available into the future, there is no way for them to uh, to vote with their dollar and say, I'm buying from this pro right to repair car company. Because that, that, that I just I want to make sure that I'm yeah, not. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, there, there are saying. some manufacturers, you know, that, are, that have been that have, that have been doing a better job of making sure their websites are accessible and, you know, that they're available and that there's, there's diagnostic software available. The problem is that, you know, we, we started back in 2014, 2015 to talk to the manufacturers about this wireless data issue. And none of them really wanted to come to the table to address the issue. And, you know, this is why we're at the place we're at. We really wanted to work out an agreement with them so that data could be would be provided to the independent aftermarket um, wirelessly because we saw where this was going. Um, and yet we couldn't get any interest to do that. And so it's, it's very frustrating um, because we think this is something that's in the best interest of, of everybody. Because if, if data is available and, and people can develop innovative solutions and innovative services for car owners, they're gonna want those cars because those are the cars that, you know, they have the most choices and the, mo the ease of repair and convenience. So we think this is a win-win for everybody. And we, we still don't totally understand why it's, there's a real reluctance to try to work this issue out and try to get consumers back in the driver's seat when it comes to their own data. If you were to try to steel man the opposition's arguments that the, 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 there are any sort of serious data security issues with any of these bills, are there any of the points that they've made where you could say, I kind of understand it, or is this just purely all made up fear among well, garbage? Well, you know, we were really careful when we were drafting this. We really did not intend, and nobody, and I don't think the bill, the, the, the law says this, is to make sure that this data is securely available. The bill does not open up the vehicles to anybody to get in and hack any system. It's very specific that it's just access to the data coming off the system. The car companies themselves build gateways to allow the data to be shared with them and, and then provide firewall protection on their, on their vehicles. There's no reason they can't provide the same access to the independent aftermarket. You know, this whole interpretation that suddenly all the vehicles are going to be opened up and they'll be hacking um, well, yeah, the vehicles are transmitting data. So there is already, this issue is already out there. They've created it, but this bill will do nothing to, to change that. The bill, what it does is, is secure access to data so that car owners who want access to their data can get access to it. It doesn't open up the internal vehicle systems to hacking. It, it just, it, you know, it doesn't, the car companies can comply with the requirements of this law and still protect their vehicles um, from unwanted access. So this is something they should be doing anyway. Um, we think that car companies should be building secure systems 
Um, because I don't want to be driving a car that's open to hacking. I want a car that's secure, but I also want to be able to control my data. So they can do both, and they're doing it now for themselves. They need to be able to do it for in, for the consumers. Would you? This is kind of a difficult one. Would do you think that third parties should have access to the code required to fix and test uh, Bluetooth hubs attached to autonomous Class Three or Four self-driving cars? Um, you know, I think the autonomous vehicle, certainly there are autonomous features on vehicles today, and there needs to be a lot, a lot of work done to make sure that, you know, everybody, including the dealerships and everybody within the system can repair those vehicles properly. Um, you know, we take the, the, the position that we, there are a lot, there are independents and dealers, there are a lot of well-trained and there are technicians out there. And they just need to be educated. Everybody needs to be educated and there needs to be a system put in place to make sure this can be done safely. I think independents can do it. I think any, anybody who, you know, in, people, I trust a lot of the shops that we have to be able to do this work. And I think this misnomer that you can only go to an authorized shop to get good repair is, is, does not mesh with the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation, there are a lot of well-trained technicians that can do this. I think we're the jury's still out on fully autonomous vehicles and how that's going to work and who's going to repair them and how, you know, whether when we're going to see those vehicles. It's still, I think, a ways down the road before we'll see fully autonomous vehicles fully on the road. So I think that's something we need to continue to watch. I think electric vehicles is still going to need to be a lot of training for all technicians on working on those cars. But the question should be, let's make sure that people who want the training can get it and that the information the tools are there and software, because the best thing that anybody can do is make sure the resources are out there to make to get these cars repaired properly and safely. What can the average consumer do if they're not able to vote with their wallet and give their money to a car manufacturer that's fully on board with all of this? What, what's the next best thing that the average everyday consumer can do to help support what it they is you're, you guys are advocating? They need to let their legislator know that, that they want to be able to continue to get their cars repaired where they want and they want access to their data. You know, we, we are looking at a federal effort in the not too distant future. Um, very soon, and I because we think you know we're gonna we're gonna need to move the Massachusetts effort nationwide. So letting their legislator know that this is an issue to them and they're concerned about it, and and we we want to make sure that we have uh, the right to repair is key. I think you know the, the whole you know every it, it's changing up there right in Washington right now. We've already heard the president just the, the other day talk about right to repair as being important. Um, the FTC has. Put out a, they put out a nixing the fix report that really indicated a lot of the issues that are being faced by independent repair industry in, in trying to repair both everything from phones to vehicles. So the government's starting to take an interest in this. The federal government um, is really starting to take an interest and we really, consumers need to make their voices heard to, um, to legislators that it's gotta change. We need to be able to have competition in the repair industry Computers, technology are great. It can make a, you know, can do a lot of really great things. But if we're going to lock those vehicles or lock other, you know, devices, then a lot of those benefits are, are not going are, are going to be are not going to be as great. So, this that's probably what I would say is the best thing they can do right now. So, if if, the, if there's not specific federal legislation that's been introduced, is there anything that they should point to and say, hey, this bill was passed in Massachusetts, this ballot initiative was passed here, I'd like something in my own state? Yeah, I think, you know, letting their state legislator know is, is not a bad idea. I think, you know, it, there's already been state right to repair efforts for devices and, and things like that. There hasn't been one similar to Massachusetts and other states, but that doesn't mean there won't be. And that's certainly something that we're looking at um, to make sure to try to move this effort forward. So we're committed to looking at the federal event, federal side and also looking at other states. Now, you guys seemed uh, particularly lucky in that none of the opposition arguments really seemed to land. Were there any pieces of misinformation or arguments that do land that you would want to clarify now? Because that whole, again, the whole, you're going to be sexually assaulted in a parking lot, it was clear that didn't work. But are there any opposition arguments that really do land with consumers that you'd want a chance to be able to respond to and, you know, just go over? Well, I mean, I think what I brought up before, the main issue that I think they kept, 
they, they, you know, they brought up this, you know, stalking issue, which was clearly not what the bill did. Um, but the cybersecurity issue is something that, you know, we take very seriously because we think if we're going to do this, it needs to be done cyber securely and needs to be protected. Um, so it can be done cyber securely. There's been demonstrations, a lot, you know, groups have been working very hard to develop st international standards for data being transmitted securely. So it can be done. It can be done cyber securely. Don't buy this argument that you, the car company owning or controlling all the data is going to be, you know, the best protection for their data. You know, it's, this is, this is not the way to go. Meeting standards, developing reasonable ways that data can be shared and protected is really the better direction and will ensure better protection for their data. Just saying that all my data is going to be in the cloud protected by the manufacturer does not give me a warm feeling um, at night. Let's put it that way. Now, you have data with, within the car that tells you, you know, is this error on this component at this time and things of that nature. What else do people probably aren't fully aware of? What other type of data is being stored in their vehicle that really has nothing to do with, you know, the, the engine? Is yeah, I mean, GPS data where your location, um, I told you, it could probably measure your weight um, on the seat. It could probably, there are ways of... Um, how you're driving, your driving habits could also be measured by the data that comes off the vehicle. There's, there's a lot of, virtually everything you do with your car is, you know, is can be measured through the sensors in that car. There's just so many modules on a car right now. And they virtually every aspect of that car is controlled by a computer module. Um, I would personally be very concerned that that data, instead of it just being monitored in real time for something else, is being transmitted to the point where they know when someone is or isn't sitting in my car. Yeah. That's a lot more creepy <laughs> to me than the concept of the mechanic that I ask can get a diagnostic code is, you know when I'm sitting in my car, you know when I'm opening my glove box and you're logging all of that. That's yeah, just you just don't know, too. Really... I mean, most people have no idea that their vehicle is really, you know, has the ability. Now, I don't know. We don't know what they do with the data or what's monitored and what's not monitored in the data. What, my point is that it's all there. And so, it, you know, it's all accessible to the to the manufacturer. If they are, we don't know. And And that's one of the things that we keep bringing up is that, we don't know what is going on with all this data. And so that's something, you know, a certain amount of transparency, I think, is healthy. And, uh, you know, I think we were trying to get to that with the Massachusetts bill. It does require a disclosure when you buy a car of what is, you know, what data is being taken and used for as part of that law in Massachusetts. Um, and that actually was not part of the car company challenge, as far as I know. So I don't know if the um, attorney general in Massachusetts may be you know, probably those requirements once the court case is over. Now, the, there is this lawsuit that was filed on around, around June 21st from the uh, Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Are there any other roadblocks that you're facing right now besides this? Actually, that was, uh, I think it was November 21st when it was filed. Um, and it's oh, in court that's... now. Uh, we don't, we're not aware of any other, once this uh, lawsuit is settled, I guess we'll make, be, be able to determine what the next steps are going to be. It would depend on what the, how the judge rules. Um, so we're kind of waiting to see where that goes in the next couple of weeks. And then we can, we'll know more about what the next steps are. Certainly, um, you know, I believe the manufacturer, you know, whoever there could be an appeal is if the judge were to over, um, overturn the lawsuit, the manufacturer's lawsuit, then there could be an appeal um, that's probably likely. So that could delay it a little um, longer. So we'll have to see how this just progresses over the next several weeks. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. No, my it. pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really uh, appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll... We'll get this right to repair bill continuing to move forward and, and we'll be able to make sure consumers have the right to get their cars repaired. All right. Yeah, you have you a good too. day. Thanks, man. Bye. And